project. I did mechanical work. Woody did the design work on the uh, vaporizing carburetor. As Preston said, the significances of this engine, which I overlooked at the beginning, are exactly what was mentioned. It is the first liquid fuel gasoline engine. It's a hot tube engine, which, as far as I know, is the first engine that utilized hot tube. Um, it's the whole premise behind the design is lightweight, because Daimler realized that lightweight and high speed is where you're going to gain efficiency and be able to get the usefulness for an engine to be used in transportation. And that was Daimler's dream. He wanted to see an engine of four horsepower, five horsepower be used in an automobile, motorcycle, some sort of transportation device. And he knew that the big, slow, clunky slide valve engines down on the end there were never going to be suitable for that application. Um, this engine is a reproduction of an original that was destroyed in a fire. This part of the engine is very close to what existed back from photos of the 1883 prototype that Daimler built to do the development of the engine. Um, it's, it's very close. Uh, the Cathay, I was not able to find too many issues with it, but this whole end of the system was a, was a when they made the reproduction in the 70s, Tom, was it? Yeah. Well, in the 1970s when Daimler uh, made this reproduction, they made a, a vaporizing system that was visually close to what the records indicated. But the internals of it, the uh, components were never there inside to actually bubble and vaporize the gasoline into a gaseous form that you needed. Now whether it was done because they knew that it was uh, could be dangerous, or whether they didn't have the drawings or the knowledge to do it, it could be a combination of both, I don't know. But the, the task at hand was to uh, make a design that was as close to the original and make it functional and actually be able to build it and to make it operate. And I got Woody to thank for uh, generous time spent on the, uh, the drawings to, to actually make the parts for, for this. Um, I'm sure someone here's got questions before I, I start this thing up. Explain the face cam. Okay. Uh, uh, there is a groove on the face of this cam disc, we'll call it, that basically gives you four cycles of operation on the uh, push rod without the use of a cam gear. So without gears, there's a track in here which has an intersection and you end up with uh, one revolution that follows one track and the next revolution the follower jumps across to the other track, almost like a figure eight, and you end up with your, your four cycles on the push rod. And another reason why Dandler liked that was because you eliminated the weight of extra gears valve, uh, drivetrain, uh, side shafts and all that, which you needed in the previous engines to uh, achieve the same thing. Speed, you, you say it's high speed, what is the, what is the speed? RPM? The, 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 it was called a high speed engine because the rated RPM on, on these early designs, they published uh, 450 to 900 revolutions a minute. Now the uh, Slide valve engines, what were we limited to, uh, Preston? About 160, 200 or something? Yeah, you're pushing 200 at times. And that was about it. The flame yeah. ignition wouldn't function. The carrier flame wouldn't, wouldn't uh, work at that speed. Is that the same scale as the original? Yes, this is a full size replica. Yeah, full size. Full size. And again, this engine was, uh, was built strictly as a test mule to develop this new high-speed principle of liquid fuel and hot tube. Um, it is just like the original. It doesn't have a cooling system on it. It's not made for sustained operation. It's not made for longevity. It is made strictly as a test mule. It's, it's what, it, what it's designed to do. So when we run this thing, and hopefully it'll start up in a little bit here, we cannot do an extended run on it, and we're also limiting the runs to a couple minutes per day for the show because there is no cooling, the piston is aluminum, which we believe is the same as the original, and the cylinder is cast bronze. And we, uh, we surely don't want to add any additional wear to it 
Um, rotation direction. Rotation is backwards from a traditional engine. It spins uh, the opposite direction. So the top of the flywheel rotates towards the cylinder head. You know that from the cam. What's that? You know that from the cam. From the cam. The cam, the cam uh, geometry dictates the rotation of the engine. That's correct. And yes, also uh, when, when Daimler made the reproduction, they, uh, they did put an arrow on the flywheel. You can keep track of your hours? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that this is a prototype with a vision towards for calling vehicles, which would go longer than one or two or three minutes. What was the eventual mode of cooling the engine? The first engine I'm aware of that Daimler made with an engine that was successfully moved itself was a, uh, we'll call it a motorcycle for lack of anything else. And that was the first engine that was the big built that would have sustained operation. And that was air-cooled. It had a, a fan and shroud system, not unlike what you'd find in a new A engine or a Briggs & Stratton engine, actually. And that's one of the only air-cooled engines they made. The uh, production engines that were made after that were all electric-cooled. Also, we went to a vertical format. Yes, yes, good point. <coughs> what you mentioned there is the, uh, the production engines, as far as I know, this is the only horizontal engine that Daimler made. What would happen to the cam follower if it backfired? Uh, the way this is adjusted, it's nothing. Okay. It, it, will, it, will, it, will, it will work fine. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, well, the question John Wilcox has. Yeah. Uh, no, the way the, the angle of the intersecting tracks uh, is an issue. Good. <laughs> Good. Is it <laughs> Good. <laughs> Any other questions? Let me start. I'm going to ask you to hold this because I'm yes. going to pick up the fire extinguisher. You can just hang out. Just, just hold it. And hang on. Good question. The question was asked I'll what, uh, what uh, the surface carburetor is. And I didn't uh, go into great detail. I'll try to explain that. Inside this, this brass vertical chamber, is a, a float. And that is one piece out of Daimler's original reproduction that we did uh, reuse for, for the carburetor. The float is buoyant and it takes air from this intake pipe here, it goes into the carburetor through a flash arrestor, which prevents flame from passing into the carburetor, down into the level of gasoline it's in. There. It's about a third full of gasoline. The, there's a series of perforated holes in this float. The intake air goes just below the surface of the liquid level of gasoline and bubbles up through the gas. When it bubbles up through, it picks up with it uh, volatiles that have evaporated from the uh, air traveling through it, and it goes out through some baffles and another two-stage flame rester I made here, which is much more effective than the original. It's made out of a centered bronze. And it goes into a mixing valve on top of the intake cage. Now what you have in this air, this air, this gas pipe, is an explosive mixture of air and vaporized gasoline. It's, it's a little bit richer than what the engine needs to operate, so on top you have a, a, a side stream bleed valve which you can adjust and it will uh, slip in air, outside air, into the fuel mixture to lean the mixture out so the engine will run. But basically what this does, this makes explosive gas out of gasoline and intake air. My How do you deal with the residue, the non-volatile? What's that? What about the non-volatile portion of the fuel? Well, if you read the literature on these, the longer they ran, the less, uh, the less effective the fuel became in the flash carburetor because the volatiles would evaporate and you'd end up with more of a paraffin or a, a waxy oil residue inside. So that's a good question. Great then you burn it in fuel. What's that? Straight regular gasoline. In here I'm just using regular plain pump gas, yeah. What case is it? What's that? What case it is. <laughs> okay. That would probably be no ball left. No all evaporates. Right. That may be something interesting to try later. Uh, one other thing that's on here, this this lower chamber in here is has liquid gasoline and the vaporizer. There's an upper chamber. This upper chamber has its own fuel source. And that's, I just have it probably a half full. And this needle valve controls the flow of liquid gasoline 
into a liquid gasoline vaporizer down here, which uh, heats the hot tube. So you've got two fuel sources, one running the, the um, flash carburetor system in here, or surface carburetor as it's called, and one operating the uh, burner for the hot tube. To get back to uh, what you said, Tom, one of the things that we did with this design that was not with the original is have to, we have the ability to take apart the you know. <laughs> Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Anyone else? Again, bear with me. I'm gonna I'm gonna heat the hot tube up. It takes a minute or so, and it's it's a, an R&D engine. We hope it'll it'll perform for us here, and the run will be limited to a couple minutes because it, it heats up very fast, and it is a little loud. Now, there is a potential here for a fire. That's why the elder Mr. Granning is standing on top of a fire extinguisher. Please note the exit where the doors are open. And keep in mind, if you're fast and the guy in front of you looks slow, slow down. We don't want anybody trampled when you're going to the exit. Let's see the exit sign, Preston. There are exit signs. Daylight. Well, again, if anyone followed us on the internet, um, we did a, uh, a flame arrestor test on this carburetor before we did anything. Uh, I wanted to make sure the design was, was adequate and I went overkill and doubled the, uh, the amount of uh, quenching uh, surfacing on the splash arrestor inside of this that, that I needed. And we pumped air through it at high pressure, vaporized the gas, and it had an explosive gas mixture coming out the outlet, and we lit it. Now if the flash arrestor didn't work, the flame would go right back in the carburetor, the whole carburetor would first. Uh, it didn't. I repeated the test multiple times and talked to a few engineers that, that uh, designed things like this and said it, 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 should, it should work much better than the original lever did because they didn't have access to the materials that we do today. So, If we thought it was a real danger, you, you wouldn't be here. No, we wouldn't be running it. back pressure to the cinder bronze? What's that? Much back pressure? Much back pressure? Yeah. I uh, didn't, didn't see any anything really significant happen with it. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to light the uh, my hot tube. <coughs> That's why you have no hair. <laughs> well, that was from last night. Now keep in mind on that one that they had in the so-called motorcycle. You were sitting on top of that. <laughs> yes, you were. Literally sitting on top of it. So you, if you can, had a fire in your you-know-what. <laughs> you can YouTube it, and there are YouTube videos that uh, they did at uh, Daimler, and it shows them lighting the fire on the, on the torch underneath the seat on the motorcycle. <laughs>
Thank you again. Thank you. 